Welcome back. In the previous lecture, we had seen an example of uh, seeing the proof of the existence of non nowhere differentiable continuous functions. In this lecture, we are going to uh, show that uh, in the space of polynomials, you cannot put a norm or metric which is complete. So, there is no complete metric or norm which can be put on the space of uh, on the space of polynomials. Okay? We have already seen that the space of all polynomials is a, is contained in the space of all continuous functions and is actually dense in the uniform uh, metric, right? So the closure of the space of polynomials in the uniform metric is the space of all continuous functions. So a natural question is can we put, uh, can we find some other metric uh, which which makes the space of polynomials themselves complete and the answer is no there is no uh, metric uh, which is possible uh, which we can put in the space of polynomials which will make it complete okay that's the idea that we are going to show in i mean that's what we are going to see in this lecture so to uh, start with to start that we have to understand uh, uh, the notions about uh, basis and so on. So I'm just going to only going to give the relevant parts for uh, for to prove this result which we want to prove in this lecture. Uh, but more or less, it's coming from the vector space structure. You must have seen most of these things. But I'm trying to do in as generality as possible. Okay. So if we have a vector space V over a field F, and if you have a subset of V, then the span of V is denoted as uh, the uh, set of all finite linear combinations of elements of U. Okay, that's what span of V means. That is, if you take any subset of V, then uh, and then you put in all finite, all possible finite linear combinations uh, with respect to the elements of U, uh, then that collection that will be called the span of U. Okay. Now the notion of linear independence. So suppose we have a subset U of V. Uh, we say that the subset U is linearly independent uh, if for any finite set of elements. Right. Let's take n elements of U. Any finite set of elements. If the linear combination is zero, then it means that the scalars has to be zero. That is, the linear combination becomes zero only when the scalars can be chosen as zero. So any non-zero scalar will not, uh, even if there is one non-zero scalar in this linear combination, then that sum is not zero. That's not possible for linearly independent uh, vectors. Okay. So we say a subset is linearly independent if for any finite set of elements that you choose, this is valid. Okay. This is what linear independence means. And what is not linearly independent, or which is called linear, uh, whenever this condition is not satisfied, then it's called linearly dependent set. Okay, these things you must have already seen in the, you know, in the vector space. Uh, when we when you did vector space theory or that that linear algebra and so on. So here we are just recalling these definitions. So we have defined the notion of span and the notion of linear independence. Okay. This is important to define the notion of basis. And then comes the notion of Hamel basis. Right? So what is in a Hamel basis? If you have a vector space, you say a subset of the vector space is, an, is a Hamel basis. Right? It's a Hamel basis if the span of U is V, that is um, every element can be written as a linear combination of elements from U. Right? And then the set U is linearly independent. So if you have such a set U in the vector space, then that is the Hamel basis of the vector space U. So what does this Hamel basis mean? So this definition basically means that every element of V can be written as finite linear combinations of it, um, finite linear combination of elements from the Hamel basis. I mean by this set, Hamel basis set, and the elements of Hamel basis are linearly independent. That is any finite linear combination. If it becomes zero, then the scalar has to be zero, right? The previous slide definition. 
So we have this notion of Hamel basis in a vector space. Okay. So as an example, let's uh, since we are interested in one, we will give this example. As an example, look at this one variable polynomials, right? Uh, so this is Rx denotes the set of all polynomials with real coefficients, okay, in one variable, right? So the x variable. So you can, as an exercise, you can show, it's easy to show that this is actually a vector space over R. And if you take this subset, all these are polynomials, which are all contained in Rx. So now you take this subset, this subset is the Hamel basis of this set of all polynomials. Okay. So this is an example of an Hamel basis of this vector space. You can generalize this uh, notion to higher dimension as well. So in higher dimension, you have a polynomial of n variable. You, again, you can show that that uh, so set of all polynomials of n variables forms a vector space over R and this subset which is the union of all x power alpha this is the multi index notation so here this x is x1 x2 up to xn this alpha is also an n tuple coming from non negative integers right that la that lattice that lattice so alpha is also an n tuple alpha 1 to alpha 1 alpha 2 to alpha n so x power alpha, the multi-index notation means that it's x1 uh, power alpha 1, x2 uh, multiplied by x2 power alpha 2, x3 power alpha 3 and so on, xn power alpha n. So this, this is that product. So each coordinate is raised to the power of, so the ith coordinate of x is raised to the power of ith coordinate of alpha, right, that product. So, and if you, we have already seen that, right, the many other, we have this concise form of writing uh, the power series, right? Uh, A alpha x alpha, which is right. You remember that, right? Uh, let's see if I can uh, something like this. We had written some time back, right? So any in uh, any polynomial uh, any polynomial can be written as alpha x power alpha where uh, a sum is over mod alpha starting from starting from 0 to let's say uh, some k right or say let's say n This is how an n degree polynomial looks like, right? So these are so any any finite degree any any polynomial in the n variable can be generated by these vectors. So that will form a. Uh, I mean, they are actually finite linear combinations of these uh, all these x alphas, right? So that is so that forms an Hamel basis of uh, Hamel basis of the of R x R x one x two x n. Okay, so the space of all polynomials forms a vector space, and it has the, uh, and and then it has a countable Hamel basis, which is all these x power alpha sets. So a question that a natural question that one can ask is: so the, all these we have defined in a vector space, you see, see. So we just have vector space structure. So does every vector space have a basis? Right, we have defined a notion of Hamel basis. Does every vector space have a basis? And the answer is, uh, I mean, for I mean, I mean, for the zero vector space, you actually don't have a basis, right? Because if you take the zero vector space, then the V cannot have any basis because the only subsets of the zero vector space is the empty set and the zero set. And both do not form a basis because zero is not linearly independent, right? And the span of the empty set is never v, okay? So we don't uh, have a basis for a zero vector space. But what about non-zero vector space, right? And the answer in there is yes. So every non-zero vector space will have an Hamel basis. That's the existence theorem, right? So this tells you that any vector space any non-zero vector space will have a 
will admit a YAML basis. So let's quickly prove this result. What is the proof of this result? So suppose I take a vector space. We have assumed it's non-zero, so V is non-zero, which means there is a non-zero element of the vector space. Let's call it x1. Okay. Now suppose this x. Uh, suppose every element of V can be written as uh, as a linear combination of x1, which means the span of x1 is V. Then we are done. Right, span of x1 is v and x1 is linearly independent, right? Because I mean, alpha x1, if it's zero, then necessarily alpha has to be zero because x1 is non zero. So, this is linearly independent, and uh, the span, if the span of x1 is v, then we are done, then we have found a basis. So, it's kind of constructed here. So, you pick a non zero element. If this is uh, if this generates v, then we can stop there, we have a basis. If x1 does not uh, generate the v, if, if the span of x1 is not v, then that means there is an element x2 which is outside the span of x1, right? We choose such an x2 which is outside the span of x1, which will be so span of x1 is lambda x1, right? In that case, so choose an x2 which is outside the span of x1, and then. Uh, look at this set x1 comma x2 and you can show that this is this is linear because by the choice this is linearly independent right because x2 if uh, alpha 1 x1 plus alpha 2 x2 is equal to 0 that means x2 is equal to uh, alpha 1 by alpha 2 x1 which means lambda is uh, Lambda is alpha one by alpha two, but you but this is that we have but we have chosen alpha two such that that cannot happen for any lambda in R, which means that x one x two is linearly independent. So now arguing like the way before, so you look at the span of x one x two. If the span of x one x two generates, uh, if is full of is the entire V, then we can stop there. We have found the Hamel basis. If it is not, then you are you you pick a element x3 outside the span of x1 x2 and so on right so this way if we stop in finite number of steps uh, steps that means we have a hamel basis of uh, finite cardinality right that can happen right so if if it stops in a finite number of steps uh, steps then we are done but the real question is suppose it doesn't stop in finite number of steps Right. So then, what happens? So if it doesn't stop at finite number of st uh, steps, then we have a chain of linearly independent subsets of V in the binary relation of inclusion. Right. Right. Because like you have x1, and then you chose x2. So x1 was contained in x1, x2. Uh, right. That set because you, here you have chosen this set x1, x2 linearly independent set. So this x1 set was is contained in x1 x2. Now you will choose x1 x2 x3. So x1 x2 is contained in the x1 x2 x3 and so on. So you actually have a uh, chain of linearly independent subsets of v. If, if it doesn't stop in finite number of steps, right? So you have a chain, and this chain is partially ordered because you have it is ordered by this relation, right? You have this inclusion. So you so it's a partially ordered set consisting of all linearly independent uh, subsets of V. So if I take the collection of all linearly independent subsets of V and I give this uh, binary relation of this partial order which is uh, which is the set inclusion, then you actually now what you have obtained is a chain in that partially ordered set A, right? You have a chain now. So now the union of all these elements of C, so it's in a uh, chain of the will uh, union of all these elements is an upper bound for the chain right natural right because the union will contain each of the elements. so it's an upper bound for uh, for the chain c in a so by zones lemma there is a maximal element right that's what zones lemma tells you that if you have a chain with an upper bound then maximal element I mean, with an upper bound then there is a maximal element so which means that there is a maximal element u in a this is the class of all Linearly independent subset, which means U is a linearly independent subset of V. So you have a linearly independent subset of V, which is a maximal element of this chain, right? That's one to this chain. Uh, 
So what we need to show is that this u uh, spans v. So the span of u is v. So for that, suppose is u is not spanning v, we are going to show, get a contradiction uh, which will contradict the fact that u is a maximal element. So if u does not span v, then there is a x outside the span of u and this a, uh, x does not belong to the span of u. Now this u union x is a linear independent subset of v, right? So, because that's how x was chosen, right? x was chosen outside the span of u. So, u, uh, u union x is in the independent subset of v, which means that uh, we have an element in A which is bigger than u, which contradicts the maximality of u, which means that our assumption that span of u is not equal to v is wrong. So, span of u is actually v, right? So, we have, uh, so we have found, uh, we have shown that for any vector space, for any non-zero vector space, you can always find a Hamel basis for the vector space, right? Either it's finite, otherwise you use the zones lemma to get the set, fine? So this is a remark that we would like to make here is that this linear combination, so suppose, so once you have a Hamel basis, which means what? It means that any element of the vector space can be written as the linear combinations of the basis elements, right? So this uh, representation via basis elements is unique, right? Because suppose the, the same element x has two different uh, representation, right? Two different, so suppose EIs are the Hamel basis of the vector space V, which is uh, finite or what infinite whatever it is doesn't matter we um, we know from the previous theorem there is an Hamel basis so which means that some uh, x can be written as a finite linear combination of the basis so then suppose there are two different representations of x right and uh, using the basis here which means j1 j2 or some finite uh, index sets some finite sets right finite cardinality set and uh, this sum is a finite sum now. Suppose x has a representation using this alpha i and there is also a representation of beta i, right, over another finite set, right. So, so, so here this can have m elements, this j1 can have m elements, j2 can have n elements and these eis could be completely uh, different, right. They are not the same, not, not, not necessarily the same eis, right. So if uh, we are going to say that x cannot have two different representations of the basis elements because suppose they do, suppose they, it has two different, then I can subtract by the vector space property, I can do x minus x, so I can subtract, so 0 can be written as a linear combination of these elements, right. So here I am just writing, uh, if I, so here you have ei, so it is alpha minus bi, so sum over j1 and j2, so this is, so if I subtract them, what I get is this that sum over the j1 intersection j2 index over that j1 minus j2 index and the index set j2 minus j1. So, 0 can be written as a linear combination of uh, this. But then all the EIs are linearly independent uh, set because it is a basis. So, it should be linearly independent which means if their linear combination is 0 and this is a finite linear combination because j1, j2 are finite sets. So if they if they are a finite if their linear combination is zero, then which means that scalars should be zero, which means that alpha i and beta i are uh, same in uh, alpha i beta i are same in j one intersection j two, and alpha i is zero and beta i is zero in j one minus j two and j two minus j one respectively. Okay, okay, so. That way we have shown the uniqueness, right? Both the scalars are uh, uh, same. I mean, n phi beta i are same. In the, otherwise, they are zero. Okay. Now, you do this as an exercise. That uh, these these things are very uh, basic steps for you. So you should you should know how to do these things. So if you have a uh, subspace v zero of v, okay. So v is a vector space, and v zero is a subspace of V and if and then V has a uh, and uh, and U0 is a basis for V0 okay so you have a vector space V and V0 is a subspace 
if u0 is a basis for v0 then you have a basis of v which contains u0 so you can basically this uh, this exercise tells you that if you have a uh, basis for a subspace then you can find the extension of the basis uh, which is a basis for the entire space okay so that's what this is saying anyway these things you try to uh, you should be already knowing these stuffs anyway so now another exercise that i want to just mention here this is is this that there is a bijective map between any two bases of a vector space see you see we have only shown that there is a uh, basis for a non-zero vector space we have not shown with a unique basis you can have more than one basis right which, which is true like in r right we have uh, every real number is a basis right in r2 any right you can have um, any if you choose two vectors not lying on the same line then they are basis so um, so that you have more than one basis so this result that tells you that there is actually a bijective map between any two bases of a vector space so if a vector space has two different hamal bases and then there is a one to one correspondence between the bases okay and there are uh, you can refer books for a proof of these these results and so on So the reason why I wanted to give this exercise is to motivate this uh, definition of uh, what is finite dimensional in finite dimensional vector spaces. So we say a vector space is finite dimensional if its basis set contains finite number of elements. Okay, that's finite. Dimension. So if you remember when, when we did the proof of existence of Hamel basis for a vector, for a non-zero vector space, we we said we have construct we did a constructive proof, right? So we said if it stops in finite number of time then we have a basis and then if it doesn't stop finite number of times then by zones from R, we said we there's a maximal element and that should be the basis right so uh, the basis can be finite so number of elements in the basis can be finite so in that case the vector space is finite dimensional okay and the which and the dimension of v is nothing but the cardinality of the basis set okay and if v is not finite dimensional then it's in finite dimensional that's the notion that we have and this we can uh, this definition is uh, precise because of the fact that if you have two different bases they have the same cardinality that's what uh, this bijective map tells you which, mean, which means that just because you have a vector space if you have two different uh, basis elements their uh, cardinality of the set will, will not change okay okay so and as an example let's uh, look at uh, i just want to give this example of uh, I'm seeing R as a vector space or Q is a field, right? So if Q is a field, R can be seen as a vector space over Q. And this vector space is infinite dimensional. R over R is one dimension, okay? Whereas R over Q over all the rationals is infinite dimensional. Means here the field that is a scalar that you choose are only rationals. Okay. Let's give I'm going to give two different proofs for this result. Uh, just as for, for the for the interesting because it's an interesting uh, exercise to do so by the theorem that we have there is a basis this is a vector space so there is a Hamel basis for this vector space let's call that b and we want to show that b cannot be finite so by the proof, we uh, the way we have seen, we know that this basis is obtained as a maximal. This is a maximal linear independent set that spans R. Okay, that is how we obtain the basis, right? If you have because if you have a bigger one, then this is not going to be a basis. So this variable basis is the maximal linear independent set that spans R. So we will show that. We will show the existence of an infinite linearly independent set over Q in R. Uh, then its span is an infinite dimensional subspace of R. Okay, which means R has to be infinite dimensional. Okay, so we are going to produce an infinite dimensional subspace of the vector space R over Q. Okay, which is obtained as the span of an infinite dimensional 
sorry an infinite linearly independent set so a linearly independent set with infinite number of elements width, right uh, and the span of that will be an infinite dimensional uh, subspace and if that is contained in r then r has to be infinite dimensional okay that's how we are going to show the infinite dimensionality of r over q so you what do you do you take the set of all prime numbers we already know that the it's a simple proof, a classical proof that the set of all prime numbers is R infinity. Okay, so there are infinitely many primes. So you take all prime numbers and you look at the set log log p. Okay, the natural logarithm of the prime numbers. So which means the set is now infinite set. This set is of cardinality infinity, right? This is all because the prime numbers are infinite numbers. I mean, infinity, uh, in, uh, prime numbers are, are infinitely many. So this set is also has infinitely many elements, log, log p. Now what do you do? You look at the linear combination. Suppose say that linear, so we, right? we want to show that this set is linearly independent and so on, right? So suppose we take this suppose uh, any finite linear combination of elements from this set is zero suppose that happens then by the fact so this if the finite linear combination of uh, some elements of the set is zero then that by equal this is same as log of product of pi alpha i which which means that and if that is zero which means that product of pi alpha l is one okay and in this case, uh, alpha i's are all scalars coming from uh, rationals, right? Okay, scalars coming from rationals. So you can also have negative rationals here, right? So you can have some negative alpha i's here in this product. You may have negative alpha i's. If such a thing happens, then you bring all the negative alpha i's onto this side, okay? Just divide them. So then you get. Uh, then you have a sub collection j such that which which is the collection in which you have all the negative uh, negative scalars alpha i's so that will come this side so you have p i minus alpha i and the remaining that is i minus j product here so what this means that you have a number here you have a number here which is uh, factored by prime numbers right so you have the same number but they have but they have uh, two different uh, prime factorization which is not possible because prime uh, which uh, which uh, because uh, any number can be uniquely factorized into primes so uh, if you don't have a negative then you already have the contradiction here right? it is equal to one so basically you are saying you have uh, prime numbers uh, you have a prime factorization for one so this is a contradiction you cannot have which means that uh, uh, if you have non-zero alpha i's here with such that this is zero then you have a contradiction which means all the alpha i's has to be zero for this to be true right which means that it's a linearly independent uh, set and it's a linearly independent uh, infinite number of sets so you look at the span of this that will be a subspace which will be an infinite dimension right these are all so subsets of r which means that r is infinite dimensional right that's how we have proved the alternate proof is uh, much more simpler what you do is that there are you know there are transcendental real numbers right what are transcendental real numbers these are not solutions to uh, algebraic uh, equations right um, so so you take a transcendental real number and you consider this uh, powers of the transcendental number uh, which is an infinite set right so tau tau square tau, tau cube and so on so you take any transcendental real number and look at the powers of the transcendental real number that is an infinite subset of r okay and by definition they are uh, linear independent we have just taken the powers here this is a linearly independent set over q Right. So this kind of scalar that can come is only over q. Right. So uh, right. So you can. So this set becomes a linear independent set over q. Right. Because see, uh, remember that these are all transcendental numbers. Right. Okay. So if 
if suppose this uh, linearly independent so in this set suppose it's not linearly independent then what happens is that you have non zero r5 rationals such that this linear this finite linear combination is zero which means that uh, uh, which means that tau is a solution the tau tau is a solution to a uh, polynomial with rational coefficients but tau is transcendental that cannot happen right so that's what i said this is a, this is a set which is uh, linearly independent so you have an infinite uh, set which is linearly independent in r so this uh, set spanned by this sub infinite dimension which is a subspace of the real line so that is how we show that r is infinite dimensional okay so now what we have seen is that we have seen that every vector space every non zero vector space i should say non zero here every non zero vector space has a thermal basis okay that we have seen from uh, the, from the theorem okay and then which means that any norm space right suppose vector space uh, what is a norm space it's a vector space which also has a norm so it's also a vector space so it also has a hammer basis okay and if the vector space is uh, finite dimensional then you have finite number of hammer basis elements right so any norm space also has a hammer basis now we will now show that uh, if you have a Banach space, that is a complete norm space. If you have a Banach space which is of infinite dimensional, right, then you cannot have a countably infinite Hamel basis. So remember what we have already seen is that any vector space has a Hamel basis, and the Hamel basis can be either finite or infinite. If it's finite, we have a finite dimensional vector space, and that's what is fine. And what we are saying here is so in a vector space, that's okay. The moment you put a norm into the verb, like for the vector space, and make it a norm space, and if it's a complete norm space, so it's a Banach space. So in a Banach space, you cannot have if it's uh, not finite dimensional, which means if it's an infinite dimensional. Right. So what, the, what, so what we expect if it's an infinite dimensional Banach space, we expect a uh, Hamel basis uh, with infinite number of elements. Yes, that's what we expect, right? which is true. But you cannot have countably infinite basis, Hamel basis. Okay, that's what uh, the result that we are going to see. So any infinite dimensional Banach space cannot have a countably infinite Hamel basis. That's the theorem. An infinite dimension Banach space always has a uncountable Hamel basis. That means it cannot have a countably infinite Hamel basis. It can have a finite. If it's a finite dimensional, it's can have finite. Infinite dimensional means it cannot have a countably infinite Hamel basis. Okay. What is the proof of that? So suppose that uh, the Banach space has countably infinite Hamel basis. Call it x1, x2, so on, right? It has countable infinite, countably infinite Hamel basis. So uh, we can uh, we can enumerate them. So let's call that uh, basis elements as x1, x2, x3, and so on. Then you form this finite dimensional subspace, which is a span of let's say the first m elements. So y1 is the span of x1, y2 is the span of x1, x2, and so on. So ym is the span of the first m elements of this uh, of this Hamel basis okay now this ym by, by definition it's a vector subspace of x right and it's finite dimensional because that is how we have defined it's, it's actually m dimensional so ym is m dimensional vector subspace of x now as an exercise you can show or you should already know that uh, any finite dimensional uh, vector subspace is closed in the norm that is given here right so ym being a finite dimensional subspace is closed so if ym is closed the complement of ym is open that's called that zm so zm is open okay so this is the complement of the um, span of first m elements and that is an open uh, open subset of x 
Now also ym being a subspace, it's a vector subspace, right? Every vector subspace has uh, empty integer. This is again an exercise, something that you should already know, right? Like in R2, the vector subspaces are all uh, straight lines and they have em they have uh, empty interior, they don't have interior. I mean straight lines passing through origin, they don't have interiors like in R. In R, all the um, all the uh, uh, vectors of space are something that should, uh, which is actually the point, which is zero, right? So uh, zero is the only proper subspace, uh, the proper vector subspace, and that is again as a singleton, it's an empty interior. So and this you can generalize to anything. Every subspace has empty interior. You can show that. So it has an exercise. So ym is empty. So ym is a closed uh, set with empty interior which means its complement is an open dense subset of x okay so zm is open dense subset of x and what we have assumed we have assumed that this x x size are basis of x right which means that the x is the union of ym right x size are m so this x is the union of ym right and uh, but which means that uh, x is the intersection of z m right so x uh, which is a complete uh, norm space it's a banach space uh, it can be written as countable intersection of dense sets right or in other words it can be written as union of nowhere dense sets it's a complete set right so what does so bare category theorem tells you bare category theorem tells you that this is uh, uh, this is not uh, uh, possible right because it's a complete for a complete uh, uh, i mean because it's a complete then space bare category theorem tells you that this is not possible which, which actually contradicts the fact i mean contradicts our ass assumption that the banach space can be written as countably union uh, can be written as can be generated by countably infinite basis elements because if that happens then you have this uh, you have this x to be written as a countable union of uh, closed uh, nowhere dense sets okay so that's a contradiction which means that a banach space is either finite dimensional if it's infinite dimensional then the hemel basis is infinite but not countably infinite. Countably infinite is not possible. Right? It's like it's not uh, of cardinality um, and of not. That's what this is saying right here. So using this, now we come to what we wanted to prove. So as a consequence of that, we can now say that the space of all polynomials cannot be completed. Cannot, you cannot have a complete metric or norm on that. Because um, we know that the space of all polynomials has the HML basis, which you have seen in the example before, has the HML basis, like in one dimension, one x square, x cube, right? All powers of x formed a Hamel basis for that space, so the space of all polynomials, which means it has a countably infinite Hamel basis. So if there was some norm which is going to make the space complete, then it becomes a Banach space and it cannot have countably infinite Hamel basis, but it has, which means you cannot find a norm which will complete the space of all polynomials. Okay, at the same time. So we have so that's what we have, we have seen that the space of all polynomials uh, can be completed under uniform norm and becomes the space of all continuous functions and so on. But there is no norm or metric which will make the space of all polynomials complete by itself. Okay, that's not possible at all. That's for this. Uh, so this is again another application of bare category theorem. So you see, we have used bare category bare category theorem to prove many things like divergence of Fourier series. I don't recall you now, right? Divergence of Fourier series, nowhere differentiable functions. Uh, we use there for space filling curve. Did we use? Uh, probably not. I don't. So we uh, we have done lots of applications of bare category theorem, right? Okay. So 
yeah this is what, what whatever i said already because the space of all polynomials if it becomes a banach space then it will contradict the above theorem because the this space of all polynomials already has a countable minimal basis given by x power this uh, whatever i said alpha right can x power alpha 1 x power alpha 2 no not comma here okay so this is whatever i wrote here your union over all alpha z plus n such that x power alpha okay that set is a countable hamel basis and so this you cannot complete it so the fact that you can have banach spaces which uh, um, which cannot have a countable hamel basis right in fact this is uh, what i mean finite dimensional banach spaces cannot have countable hamel basis is what motivates um, us and to uh, the notion of other kinds of basis right uh, which we, I will not do it here. So basically, a Banach space is either finite dimensional, or it has an uncountable Hamel basis. So to uh, to deal with this uncountable Hamel basis situation is uh, is why we uh, we get into this notion of uh, what is called uh, shorter basis. Okay. So what is so uh, one can show that in finite dimensional separable Banach space as a Hamel basis. Which is in one tone corresponding with a set of all real numbers. Basically, the cardinality of a uh, separable Banach space is L of one. Okay. So the concept of Hamel basis has to be relaxed in an infinite dimensional Banach space, and uh, that is how the notion of shorter basis comes in. What does shorter basis do? It takes into see what happens in Hamel basis is that. Hamel base, uh, when you put a norm, it becomes a topological vector space, right? Whereas Hamel base is, uh, is only using the vector space property. We, it is not using the topological property. So what shorter basis does is that shorter basis basically brings in the topological aspect also in the definition of basis. So you need the span, you need linear independence, and you need and the closure. So that's the topological property. Closure is the topological property. So shorter basis basically tells you. So I mean, a shorter basis is the one in which uh, the set is. Uh, I mean, the set is linearly independent. And when you say span, you expand the notion of span not just by finite linear combinations. You closure of finite linear combinations. It means you also uh, you also accept uh, infinite sums, right? That's uh, that's the idea here. So shorter basis does that. Anyway, so with this we have uh, completed uh, more or less. Uh, I think everything about that I wanted to say about continuous functions or differentiable functions and so on and the subsets of continuous functions and everything. Okay. See you in the next lecture. Thanks a lot. Bye.